the arts can stimulate the transformation of scientific knowledge and research results into innovative solutions, engaging and creating value for citizens and industry, while building bridges with other knowledge uh, valorization actors. Uh, you know, the, the arts can be can act as a catalyst. They are the glue of new knowledge and concepts with people. Artists, through their practice, tend to first embrace new knowledge and integrate it into their work. This is why it is important also to keep them in proximity and involved along the knowledge chain. And this work acts as a Trojan horse to an unsuspected sometimes audience, infusing people, minds, with new information and ideas. In a nutshell, arts translate complex content into comprehensible language and opens up new sources of knowledge and information and are increasingly involved in the dissemination of research results due to their ability to communicate in an unconventional way. Today, we have uh, here in this uh, group um, um, three amazing uh, co-hosts um, um, to do a short presentation first um, of the results of a recent study on the topic acting as an introduction we have uh, Isabel de Voldere from IDEA Consult, who will explain the main findings on the study they did on fostering knowledge valorization through the arts and cultural institutions. And of course, we have uh, two real life examples that show how the arts and cultural institutions contribute to knowledge uptake. We have Nana Redekovic, from, uh, who is co-founder of Nova Iskra Creative Hub, uh, which is connected creative industries with technology and people. And Fabrizio Panozzo, uh, professor uh, of University of Venice and associate scholar of the European Institute for Advanced Studies in Management in Brussels, who is part of Artificare, a research project who is connecting arts-based processes and the innovation and competitiveness of enterprises. So it's a really nice session, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. But first, Isabel, uh, I think you are the best person to take us through uh, the research you just did. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Valdinis, for uh, for this introduction, and uh, indeed happy uh, to uh, uh, to be here today uh, as well. Uh, so I'm Isabel de Volder, and I uh, work at the Consult, and together with my uh, my colleague uh, Martina Fraioli and uh, the support of. Professor Bart van Dooy, uh, we have uh, conducted in the past uh, months a study on behalf of uh, the European Commission, researching uh, indeed uh, the, the role that uh, arts and cultural institutions take up in, uh, in fostering knowledge valorization. Uh, and in the next couple of minutes, I'm uh, happy to, uh, to share some of the study uh, findings. Um, now it will be only some uh, some main highlights. Uh, I invite everybody to uh, keep an eye on the website of uh, the European Commission uh, when in the coming weeks the full report will be uh, will be published with uh, much more information uh, uh, on uh, on this topic and uh, and the research. Next slide, uh, please. Thank you. Um, so when we uh, analyzed uh, the, the many practices that we found across uh, Europe where arts and cultural uh, organizations contribute to uh, fostering knowledge valorization, we found them actually in, uh, um, in diverse collaboration settings. Uh, uh, maybe um, one would think uh, automatically of uh, uh, the role and uh, the engagement of arts and cultural organizations uh, in a dissemination role, where they, uh, uh, first of all, are engaged to communicate and disseminate uh, knowledge that has been created uh, actually by others uh, um, before uh, in the uh, in knowledge creation processes. So rather at the end of, uh, uh, of the knowledge flows. But what we found in the study is really that arts and cultural organizations are engaged throughout uh, the these knowledge uh, creation processes from the start uh, to the end and in different roles. Eh? So I've talked already about this dissemination role, but also a very important role that arts and cultural organizations play in uh, uh, fostering knowledge valorization is a role of intermediation where they um, uh, connect 
scientists, with entrepreneurs, with civil society in, um, uh, in discussions, but also where they uh, uh, put their, um, uh, uh, their artistic skills in, uh, in practice, in participatory processes to really engage uh, scientists with citizens and industry to uh, to discuss and participate uh, actively uh, in research. And then finally, also, uh, we find arts and cultural organizations uh, and uh, uh, also in a set of uh, joint research uh, where they are uh, co-researchers, uh, really uh, also co-defining uh, and exploring new uh, research topics, research questions that are uh, um, valuable and relevant for, uh, for society. Now, what actually do they bring uh, to the table, uh, artists and cultural workers? Um, they participate in these uh, collaborations really with a unique set uh, of competences. Vasily has already uh, indicated it in, uh, in the introduction of this, uh, of this session, but what artists and, uh, and cultural workers have and bring to the table is that um, uh, both uh, uh, researchers and citizens are really stimulated to think much more in a meta-systemic uh, uh, perspective about uh, societal challenges. Because when we look at, uh, at science and, and research uh, in general, we could say that in, in, in the past de decades, the, uh, the trend was really uh, to, uh, uh, towards much more and deeper specialization uh, in, in science. Whereas when we look at societal challenges, they have become actually ever more complex and more systemic in nature. So really, um, this is, it is needed. Uh, uh, when we uh, uh, talk about uh, impactful uh, knowledge val creation and, and knowledge valorization to uh, uh, also take this step back and this, uh, this uh, uh, systemic perspective. And artists and, um, and cultural workers really have this, uh, this ability to take researchers and citizens and uh, um, industry to take this, uh, this more uh, meta uh, perspective, also alter the way that they experience and have uh, a view on the world. Another element that uh, artists uh, uh, bring to the table is to really also stimulate speculative thinking and um, imagining uh, um, sometimes unimaginable future, uncertain future, and from there think about uh, uh, relevant uh, solutions and research questions for uh, for society. And finally, also uh, through arts works, uh, artworks, but also the artistic skills that they uh, uh, use in participatory processes, they provide uh, a language often to many complex uh, concepts and content um, in, in, in research, and uh, but also to give expression uh, to, uh, to doubts, uh, to nuance, uh, to opinions, uh, in, in society with respect to uh, these problems, but also the research uh, that, is, that is being done. Next slide. A final element that we uh, uh, looked at in the study is to look at what are actually the, uh, the conditions that uh, um, artists, uh, where artists can flourish in these collaborations. And we have uh, uh, identified uh, or um, uh, four different pillars. One element relates to the valorization frameworks and support, uh, where it is important to uh, have really a more open definition of valorization. The next element relates to networking and interaction. Uh, the more frame, frameworks, networks and platforms there are where all these different stakeholders can meet with one another, scientists, society, uh, informal and infor and formal settings, the more you have these types of collaborations. A fourth, uh, a third pillar, uh, sorry, is awareness creation and uh, recognition. And the more um, uh, the unique competences of artists and cultural workers are recognized, the more you see these, uh, uh, these uh, collaborations happen. And then finally is the support, supporting both uh, uh, researchers and artists in developing the right skills and capacity to uh, participate in these, uh, in these processes. 
In the study, we have uh, analyzed several uh, case studies, and I'm now uh, very happy that uh, today we have uh, two speakers that will talk much more about uh, their experiences and their uh, role that they play in uh, providing these uh, enabling conditions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Um, really great input. Really quick question. Um, so I, I, I see you describe three kind of roles, the arts and culture organizations as ambassadors for knowledge. Uh, also that they can act as an interface between scientists and people, and also that they stimulate new research questions coming directly from society. So do you see them that they should be kind of embedded early on in kind of uh, all this knowledge production? Yes, yes, uh, definitely. Um, we see that the earlier they are actually involved in these, uh, in these processes, one could say that the more impactful uh, uh, the, the knowledge creation is for uh, for society and the uptake. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, yes, uh, definitely, um, it's uh, it's very valuable to uh, to involve artists and uh, cultural organizations already uh, quite early, um, even from the start on, uh, in these processes. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you so much. And um, we have to move forward, but we have the opportunity to chat about it uh, a bit further the way. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you Nadar, Nana Redekovic, uh, co-founder of Nova Iskra Creative Hub. Nana? Hi, nice everyone. Hi. Hi, hi, everyone. Good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here today. And I will share a small story of how we try to tackle um, a world around us using um, um, uh, modules and uh, methods that we are all trying to experiment so far and using the knowledge and valorize the whole uh, process of uh, using this kind of uh, approach to uh, creating collaborative projects. So I'm from Nova Iskra. My name is uh, Nana Radenkovic. Uh, please next. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a co-founder uh, for almost uh, 12 years now. We are running a hub in Belgrade. We have three spaces, but uh, the question is, please next, uh, and next, uh, what is a hub? And uh, sometimes uh, I like to say that hub can be a physical space, and we are lucky to have this uh, physical uh, concept, but on the other hand, it's a new model, it's a hybrid organization, please next that I like to see as a complex uh, uh, network uh, of uh, various um, entities, stakeholders and sectors that should and could and, and, and would be nice to meet and collaborate. So I put here uh, some of the uh, uh, stakeholders and sectors that we are uh, working with. And as you see, there is a, a lot of startups, companies, but also SMEs, we're connected with the public sector and also NGOs. We try to be connected with academia as much as possible. Sometimes it's not easy, especially in the Balkan context. But also we like to be connected to the individuals, be it that they're coming from creative sector or wider. It's not easy task, but that's what we believe is the uh, groundwork and ground base for what I'm going to show you later on. Please next. So the question is actually, why do we need these new organizations? Either they're being uh, uh, physical or, or digital or um, uh, hybrid as, 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 a, as, a, as a kind of a, a ground, as I said. Uh, next, please. Um, so, I mean, we will all be uh, agreeing that there is a plenty of reasons and the world is changing in front of our eyes. Please, next. Uh, we are really uh, living in a specific um, moment and I do not need to stress all the elements that are um, creating our everyday life today. And what we see is that it is really, please next, uh, that those that uh, are really complex problems. And actually, if you Google uh, the, the term wicked problems, it appears that all those problems that we are facing right now are really difficult to define. Uh, they're really interconnected and each solution can create even bigger problems and challenges on another side. So what do we need actually is that 
we already agreed that we are gonna take care of those wicked and uh, complex problems. Please, next. And that happened actually from this perspective long ago. And I will just remind us for a second that all those wicked and uh, complex challenges are already embedded in what we already know is, please, next. Uh, of course, the SDGs. In every of those uh, uh, elements and, and problems that we already identified, we can find our role, be it an, as an individual, please next, or as an organization. But the crucial element to all these aspects of dealing with really complex problems is actually the uh, number 17, please next. So it's actually that we need to partner in order to achieve all those goals. The question is, are we capable of doing it? And sometimes I'm actually wondering if we are uh, testing all the abilities for us as organizations and individuals to involve all the knowledge and all the perspectives as much as we could. I'm happy to be part of the hub where we as a, a mission have to actually involve all the knowledges and perspectives, but sometimes it's not easy. Please, next. So I, I'm appealing to all of us and I'm calling all of us to actually work on improving our partnership abilities. Please, next. And of course, to include all of these uh, skills of 21st century that we take for granted so for, for so many times, but actually we do not uh, create enough time to be creative or to think uh, twice about the issue or to try to have more time to research or to use as much as possible uh, knowledge that we can provide. Of course, having in mind the most uh, wider perspective on the challenge that we are trying to solve and, and being able to communicate not only to stakeholders but to individuals to involve as much citizens as possible. And at the end, to try to create this collaborative aspect for uh, most of the people that we can reach at that particular context that we are working on. Please, next. So for us, collaboration is the key as an organization and as uh, individuals. And please, next. And we think that collaboration needs to happen in few steps. Uh, first, we need to know ourselves as individuals and as organizations what is driving us, what we can bring to the table, what are specialties and special powers and skills and, and resources that we, that we are bringing, then to find appropriate partners that we can align with values, but also to talk about intentions, like what kind of impact we want to create together. And at the same time, we need to know what is the purpose, why are we doing it and for, for who. At the end, when we align all of these elements and try to communicate and connect, we start to collaborate. And then together we should co-create the process, but also the culture of how we're gonna exchange in order to innovate and actually create some kind of change that we want to tackle. Please next. At the end, what we think is the most important, and I'm not sure that we are doing our best in this aspect, is actually to share knowledge from all the previous uh, projects and collaborations that we did and try to reach out to others who are trying to work on the similar or same issues in, in different contexts. So um, please next. I think that this could be a new way to actually tackle all these complex problems and involve citizens, individuals, and different organizations in this process. Us as a hub, we see uh, our role uh, to actually uh, facilitate this complex process that we all should learn while doing. So thank you for uh, your time. This is our perspective of how knowledge, data, citizens, and all, all of the organizations could actually collaborate in this new process of reviving uh, all of the aspects that we need to revive or question or, I don't know, solve. <laughs> Well, Nana, thank you very much for your input. Uh, so, so dense every time I hear you speak. That's great. And uh, so in a nutshell, you said that we should align, connect, collaborate and share these four primary values. And you talked a lot about your hybrid format of intersecting the different sectors and connecting with society. Uh, do you think that this is a main priority as a role for a hub like yours? I think we need to 
to create a new context of collaboration. And I think the question, uh, the, the role of the hub is to, to ask right questions. I think that the hub should not come with solution, but actually to create a context where questions can be asked and knowledge can be used. But also, I think the hubs are um, a, a, a nice place to actually question things and to create some kind of a free area for all of the sectors to actually uh, lay down all of the knowledge and maybe rethink all the things again with all the data and knowledge we already have. So I think that hubs as a, as a concept, not only as a, as a physical space, could be used for the future connections. So unlearn, learn again, and try another way, pilot, test. And I think this could be, this could be our, our role. So the artistic way, way, but so you're not just a lighthouse of knowledge. That's what you're saying, that you're bringing current topics that shows organizations like yours are agile and responses to today's societal challenges. And uh, that you're also developing transversal skills with the organizations, within the organizations, actually, and the people. Well, exactly. that's great. I, I mean, I great think, interest. I think yeah, I think that uh, the, uh, what scares me the most is when one organization or one individual comes and says, says we have a solution. Because I think that uh, if we are looking at it uh, from this one dimension, the solution is always questionable. We, we need to, to take it again and to ask questions, does it bring solution and value to a wider uh, aspect of people or, or, I don't know, organizations. So for me, I think this is the area. And there is a question in, in chat in Slido. Maybe I can refer to that as well. What are the barriers to overcome Let's... for artists to collaborate with industry or science and reverse? I think this is a crucial question because uh, I believe that hubs, and not only hubs, but all of the organization can actually uh, create mi micro hubs within their processes where they can allow this communication and collaboration to happen. So we need to be open to invite artists and to involve them in the process of solution uh, making processes, because I believe that everyone can contribute. We need to be inclusive. We need to uh, embrace all of the perspectives that are given to us in order to tackle the as I said prior, there is so, ma so much work to be done. We have too many issues uh, on our hands, even before pandemic and war and everything. So I think uh, if people want to, uh, uh, to, coll to collaborate, we need to uh, imagine new processes, the way how to include as much as possible actors in these processes. Nana, this is great input. I, I hope we will have uh, more time in the end to further develop your thoughts. But without further ado, then last but not least, we have uh, Fabrizio Panozzo from Artificare Research Project. Fabrizio, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, everyone. And thank you for the invitation to share with you what we've been doing in Venice in the last few years. Uh, this is a presentation of the Artificare Artification Project, which started uh, in 2014. Uh, in Venice, uh, and then was, in a way, experimented and spread also in other European contexts, thanks to European projects. Uh, and uh, basically, our practice uh, is, is in line with what we just mentioned, even with, with the question we just heard. We, we try to, to bring art and business together uh, under the assumption and trying to, to verify this idea that, that there is a, a possibility of deeper understanding and deeper collaboration between uh, uh, artistic work, cultural work, and business uh, processes. And by deeper, we mean something that moves beyond the traditional sponsorship or financial support that the businesses are often requesting to offer to cultural and artistic work. There is a deeper uh, possibility of collaboration in which innovation can can sparkle. And in order to 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 test this idea, but also to to provide concrete examples, we we activated the dispositive of the residence, which is typically a dispositive that is used in the artistic world 
And we came up with this idea that we can have artistic resonances in business environments. Uh, so we, as, as, a, as a research laboratory uh, at the Department of Management of Kowalski University, we took this role of, of the mediating agents because another important element is that when you try to bring together these two dimensions in a more meaningful way, you need something to do the tricky job of creating bridges, of, of creating connections between the two languages uh, and the two domain. And then we replicated these projects uh, in, uh, over time, these experiments over time. Uh, we, we, are, we have an experience of around 30 um, collaborations between art and business in, uh, in Italy, and we've uh, expanded this in other European countries as well. Uh, here I have a few slides, if you can quickly roll them. We have pictures of, of what actually the practice is about. These are artists working in business environments captured at very moment of, of the process. Uh, we, again, this is a long-term project that we, we started a few years ago and we hope to maintain in, in the future. The issues that we try to tackle uh, are, first and foremost, to, to explore the creative preconditions of innovations. We believe that, you know, we all believe, we, we scholars of Venice, we believe that, and we constantly search for this origin, uh, this, this holy grail in which innovation begins. And, and we, we, we wanted to capture this initial sparkle, the precondition of innovation, which cannot be designed. We think it did not be designed. It happens somewhere, somehow, and we, the, the, the hypothesis we made is that art can be one of these preconditions. On the other side, we all also wanted to demystify the rationality of the artist. Stereotypes are a problem in this domain. So on one side, we wanted to show how the artist is, is not necessarily this romantic agent operating without any um, understanding of constraints or planning. And on the other side, we also wanted to deconstruct the supposed rationality of the manager. We, as management professors, we often uh, rely on this image of the manager as a calculator, as a planner, while when we investigate real managerial life, we realize that managers are not often uh, so rational as we would like to design and project them. And then we also wanted to capture the essence of European manufacturing. European manufacturing has, has centuries, pre-industrial uh, pre revolution, pre-capitalist ways of producing. And in those pre-capitalist, pre-industrial revolution modalities of production, there is a profound connection between the arts, culture, and um, the, the, the work of the enterprise. And we also wanted to have this resurfaced and put on the agenda. And, and we also investigated the combination between the beautiful, the sustainable, and the together, which has now become quite rightly so fashionable, thanks to the European Commission. But we are proud to say that we started a few years before. Next slide, please. Uh, we think that transfer uh, is a fundamental uh, part of this process we've started with working with replication. In order to understand whether these experiments actually work, whether they make sense, we needed to replicate them. So we, we transferred within our region, within our country, but then Thanks to European support and European projects, especially coming from the Interact program, we were able to expand these models of interaction in other, in other European countries. Uh, we think that transfer um, and the application is, is useful in, in these cases because it, it triggers the, this mythical idea of the lateral thinking. It asks uh, fundamental questions in the business environment, but it also invites the artists to reflect more deeply on the economic and managerial processes which are so relevant in our societies. We can also think that the transfer is significant because it reconnects businesses with their social environment. It's a way to express corporate social responsibility and re-establish a dialogue between small and medium enterprises, especially, and the, the, the geography and, and the social geography of the place in which they, they exist. And also because it is a way of better understanding and again deepening the notion of what we mean when we bring together the cultural, the creative and the industrial in the same expression, giving a deeper meaning to this expression, as I'll try to say later in the four remaining minutes. And that's my third, uh, additional slide, please. Uh, how do we measure success of this? Uh, what one, uh, one fundamental 
element is the emancipation from public funding. The more they function autonomously, the more the artists become a provider of services for business enterprises, the more the business enterprises see the artist as a potential partner, we, we will have achieved success. And the more also the art system, the galleries, the museums, they look at these experiments as something that actually creates also a market for, for artwork and, and for the career of, of the artists. That's again a sign of success. And then other signals of success we've seen is the development of prototypes. In several cases, these interactions between artists and businesses, they moved into a phase of identifying new products or changing the processes or improving the brand awareness of those firms that actually decided to collaborate with, with artists. And, and last but not least, also, we, we've seen examples of the improvement of organizational climate and workers' welfare. Next slide, please. We've learned uh, a few lessons, uh, just a few here. Uh, we've, we've learned that, that these ideas that we often use, that the art and business are two separate words, is largely a rhetorical expression, that they are more similar, that we are often willing uh, to, to accept and, and to discuss. Business can be very emotional, as I said before, and art can be extremely calculative. And this is very interesting because this forms a common ground between the two. We've also learned that innovation is painful. This is something that we often forget when we talk about innovation. There is a frictional moment at this origin, at this, this precondition of innovation, frictional moments. And we believe that art and the artist can, can help suit in a way or, or support or, or, or look help the business enterprise to look at this frictional moment in a different way. With irony, we've discovered irony. Irony is a driver of transformation and very often artists and art is ironic because they are able to look at conventional situations or at wicked problems from a different way and very often that difference is ironic. So the power of irony. We've also discovered uh, policy-wise that CCI is probably it was probably an outdated category, and we need to move forward. Uh, find, uh, move to the next slide, please. Um, the challenge we are facing, also asking to the question, that, uh, replying to the question that was asked before, you need to find the right balance between the stereotypes of art and business. Uh, there are risks, of course, that, that, that have to be tackled. One risk is the one of interpreting art as the mere decoration of the status quo. So nothing changes, but the artist provides colors and paintings and, and new drawings on the wall. On the other side, there is a risk on the artistic side to look at business as a mere provider of resources, as a place in which you find beautiful materials to conduct your artwork outside of the business environment. The challenge is to be uh, a mediator. So we, we've taken up this role as a university. We, we, we've experimented in this role. We've developed and we've done research on how to conduct this activity. But of course, other agents, other institutions could work on this middle ground between the two. Next slide, please. What could the EU do? Uh, that's a very interesting question, which, which was asked to me, but that, that uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the EU for existing. Much of what we've been able to do is, is I would say all that we've been able to do has been supported by European funds. So thank you very much. Keep doing that. Uh, maintain an exploratory approach and be bureaucratically creative. I know it sounds like an oxymor, but this is a challenge for policymakers as well to mix, to combine, to move outside of the silos of the directorates, of the ministries, combine funds, uh, look at problems at the same time from the human capital, from the infrastructure, from the innovation point of view, and combine minds and funds in, in, in the same projects. Avoid buzzwords and consultancy and managerial jargon. This is something that we should also reflect upon as management scholars and management consultants. Very often we provide buzzwords that last only a few months, but then they are incorporated into European policies. So we should be, you should be very uh, sort of reflective on how we use those, those words. 
critically reflect on the idea of impact and, and metrics. Impact is very fashionable uh, these days, but we need to find more fine-grained uh, ideas of what impact means and maybe reflect on whether we can truly always use numbers to measure impact or whether we can think of other ways and go back maybe to more traditional way of understanding impact. Uh, and finally, something that I found very uh, refreshing dealing with the staff of the European institutions is that there is a wealth of knowledge within the staff, within the personnel of the European institution and accumulated expertise and knowledge that should be celebrated more. Uh, so one, one final uh, suggestion to the EU is rely more on the accumulated knowledge of the permanent staff. This is a plea also for, for me as a civil servant that we have a lot within public organizations. We've learned a lot and we should celebrate what we've learned. Thank you very much. So I think, Vasilis, we can take some questions from the Slido. Could it be that we lost Vasilis? Well, if that's the case, then I take a, a question from the Slido and it is uh, for uh, I think mainly for Nana, this one, uh, but please you can also uh, contribute. So are artists really increasingly more willing to engage with citizens and civil society these days? Uh, and do they really want to play a role, um, a stronger role in innovation and in knowledge valorization? W what is fueling this trend? Why is this happening if that's a trend? That's a question from from the audience? Nana. Well, that's a, good, that's a good question. I think from our experience, they're willing. But the question is, do they know that they're invited? So I think that we need to uh, communicate louder and more direct with the artist and creative community, because sometimes I think with, with real reasons, they believe that they're just sometimes used as, uh, as not a real participant, but as objects of project. So what we try to do is actually involve artists and creatives from the beginning, in the process of co-creation, in, in the process of uh, actually uh, understanding the challenge and the problem. And I think this is the crucial. And, and I see the change in the uh, perspective of, of artists that they sometimes see themselves as excluded. But this is not only their fault. I believe that us as hubs and other organizations, we need to actually include them more in the processes of solution-based projects. This is my, my, my opinion. Great, thank you very much. And so Fabrizio, if you want, you can also add to this question, but I think the question, uh, the, the other question from Slido, which is, was it difficult to find companies that were willing to welcome an artist? Uh, is really more for you on the industry. Yeah, well, actually, there are combined questions, so I, I can also try and reply to the first one. We are the living proof that, that there is a desire to collaborate and there is a possibility to collaborate. We've conducted uh, 36 of these episodes in the Veneto region alone. I am moving as right now to, to start a new one, and I've concluded a, a, a one on Friday last week. So, yes, there is interest, there is possibility, as Nana said, it is a matter of creating the conditions. So we need intermediate agents like the hub, uh, like us uh, uh, in, 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 in the academic environment to create the condition. But once the creation, once the condition is created, there is interest uh, on both sides. So to answer the second question, no, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't difficult to identify companies that were willing to host and, and keep with them for a while the, the presence of the artist. And it wasn't difficult to identify artists that, that were curious of interacting with the business environment. The problem is to 
to make this process independent. So far, we've been the actors. We, I mean, the university, we've been the actors facilitating this. We are progressively trying to emancipate the two actors and let them work independently of us. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like now to have a, a very, very last message from each one of you, what you want to leave this session with, and I start with Isabel. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, actually, I uh, first want to refer to uh, uh, maybe the title of the previous uh, uh, webinar, uh, where it, uh, it is said that uh, um, research and industry should uh, tango uh, with two to tackle societal challenges. Uh, I would say uh, let's open the, the dancing floor, maybe not to tango uh, with uh, with three or four, but uh, but to disco and uh, to uh, to indeed uh, um, recognize also um, uh, artists and uh, cultural workers, but also citizens uh, and invite them on the dancing floor uh, as well together with the uh, uh, with research and industry uh, to tackle those societal uh, challenges. Wonderful. Nana. I would definitely add on, on that uh, aspect. I believe that uh, we as organizations working in the area of culture and creative industries, I think we should switch from creating and building audiences to uh, creating uh, conditions for citizens and audience to co-create and participate in the process of creation. So this is, I think, a switch we could and should take in another um, in another period of time because I think this is something we all should practice a little bit more. And all we all need it because, as I said before, so much challenges around. Thank you, Nana and Fabrizio. Yeah, following on on Isabel's suggestion to, to to this musical metaphor and dance metaphor, we need we need people to dance together. But people will dance together if the music is right and if the music is good. Uh, so we need new music and we need new directors. We need composers, uh, and and composers are and directors are at the policy level. So we, we need, as I said before, more creativity also at the policy level. We need good composers, good DJ sets, uh, so that people could dance and and this is a message again for us which are in this intermediate level and for the EU uh, as well. I think it's wonderful to finish with a message about music and dance in this session. Uh, it, it's clear that the arts and cultural institutions can do a lot to engage with different partners, industry, but also civil society, and can can do a lot to promote uh, innovation and knowledge valorization. Uh, and we really need to 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 look how to to strengthen this. Uh, and uh, I think you already uh, all of you do a lot in this. Uh, and I thank you again for taking part to this wonderful session.